my baby But I ain't coming back Well, I ain't coming back Roll on, buddy Don't you roll so slow Just how can I roll When the wheels won't go Roll on, buddy Put your load of coal The song 16 tons is one of those things that you can go anywhere and say 16 tons and then people will say, oh, okay, that's who Merle Travis is. You get another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. Even though he lived away from here most of his life, he was, he was pure Kentucky through and through. Underneath this cowboy coal mine image was a great deal of sophistication and depth. There are really two kinds of people. <laughs> in, uh, in terms of songwriters, especially guitar players, there's people who understand that they owe a debt to Merle Travis for what he offered and what he did, and there's people that haven't heard of him yet. Merle was certainly a ring leader in that style and in that look that has become synonymous with country music today. He was the first and foremost Merle. Deeper in debt, St. Peter, don't you call me cause I, I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. I was born November 29th, 1917 in Rosewood, Kentucky. Rosewood, by the way, is in Muhlenberg County. If you'd look for that on a map, you'd never find it. It's not there. But you'll find Greenville. It's the county seat. It's in southwestern Kentucky, almost exactly between Nashville, Tennessee, and Evansville, Indiana. I never lived in any other county in Kentucky but Muhlenberg. It's one of two places I've been in this country where you can be there and tell this is where the music comes from. Merle Travis was a world-class musical citizen. I would have to think at any point in his life, and especially I would think as a young uh, listener as a young musician, uh, he, he must have been a sponge. Arnold Schultz was an African-American picker that came out of uh, Ohio and Butler County, Kentucky, over across the Green River. According to his family, you know, he traveled a lot back in the early days, you know, the teens and the 20s. He would, river travel was a big thing, so he would get on the Green River and catch boats and travel, and some say he went as far as New Orleans, but he picked up a lot of different styles. He brought a lot of songs back into this area. And in this area, there's a fellow named Kennedy Jones, who we credit being the first guy that, in our line of playing, our genealogical thumb-picking line, Kennedy was the first man to use a thumb pick. Of course, he shared them with some of the guys that was following him around, guys like Ike Everly, who was uh, Don and Phil Everly's daddy, and Mose Rager. And those two guys, you know, they wanted to do what, what Kennedy was doing. Merle came around, I guess, to learn from Mose Reger. And my father, Merle, gives uh, Dad a lot of credit for uh, helping teach him, actually, a few chords here and there and whatever. Now yeah. start picking the Kimball right? Yeah. Great. I got to talk with Merle, he said, if it hadn't been for Moles, I'd probably be picking up Lunium cans. He said, it's too lazy to work in the mines. Well, there was a couple of guys around my hometown named Moles Reger and Ike Everly, and they played that style, and I'd listen to them and then go home and try to play like them. And that's, that's where I got the style. I didn't know at that age that I was living in what would be later referred to as the Great Depression. The Rob Travis family never lived in a house with electricity, plumbing inside or out. We never had a radio. We never even had rugs on the floor. Dad never owned a car in his life. We had no horses or mules. And our lights were coal oil, kerosene lamps and our drinking water come right out of the spring. Mom cooked on a coal stove, and the house was heated with a coal fireplace. 
he was a colorful character, and he brought his culture with him to the table of country music and to the table of American music. And boy, that's what made it so rich and so beautiful at that time in country music is everybody brought who they were to the table and where they came from. It was not a homogenized society then. Uh, Travis brought Muhlenberg County, Kentucky by way of Hollywood and wherever else, you know, in WLS in Chicago, all those stops along the way. And the subtotal was him. A lot of people give Merle Travis credit for inventing the kind of guitar playing that he perfected. And Merle would be the first one to tell you that that wasn't the case. There was a long tradition of this kind of guitar playing that was centered in the area that he grew up in, Muhlenberg County, Kentucky. And he was just the one person to perfect it and popularize it. I don't ever remember actually sitting down and practicing playing the guitar. You can tell that by the way I play. But I don't remember sitting down to drink a lot of water either. The guitar was there, and when I felt like it, I'd grab the thing up and pick around on it, just like I'd pass the water bucket, and if I was thirsty, I'd take a drink. I'd feel around on the strings until a chord sounded right, and then I'd frail away on that pretty sound that I'd discovered. Travis Picking is a real all-inclusive style of guitar play in the the right hand is really where most of the, the action takes place. So you have a, a, a thumb playing the, the bass note. And in between that bass note, it plays the chords. And the finger on the right hand here, Travis used one, plays the, the melody. chord knowledge up and down the neck of a guitar was was not your basic hillbilly player. How he put all of this together and made chords fly and, and words fly and style fly out at the same time, it was, it was a sight to behold. It was a sight to hear. It was a great sound to hear. And here comes Travis with his thumb pick playing it all a whole different, different way where people say, what is that? Because it was still the same kind of country music, but instead of going, you know, he was doing it playing his stuff. I first ran into uh, Merle's playing through Chet Atkins. And of course, I didn't see him do it, I heard him do it, because that's back in the days when records was how we learned. And so I heard this great tune, Walking the Strings, and it caught my ear right away before I knew that Merle had written it. And I learned how to play it wrong, which was if you play three notes, with thumb, index, and middle, you can get all the notes in there. But the way Merle would play it is with his thumb playing two of those notes, so that his thumb is always dunk chick, dunk chick, and then when you get the dunk chick, dunk chick, that's your index finger on the off. So he would hear, and it was a classic kind of a, everybody now just calls that walking the strings, even though there's a tune called walking the strings. That thumb and one finger, which is the basis of his way of playing. Guitar playing before Merle got out in the world, it was sort of like you'd be two guitar players, one would be playing. Which is pretty, and another guy would be playing the rhythm while he's doing it. But when Merle came along, he added the rhythm, the bass, and sometimes some harmony and all to that melody, and it played by itself. figured out a way to play the, the bass run with his fang, the thumb and having that moving along while he da, 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 over the top of it with his other fingers. So it sounded like two guys. So Merle's thumb picking style that covered the bass, covered the rhythm and covered the melody and just had a feel all to its own, filled up a lot of space. You know, to have that going underneath it all, was a beautiful thing to have. Man alive, how hungry can you get? 
Oh, give me some harmony grits And some red sugar-cured ham Give me a great big bowl of brown gravy I would be such a happy man If I could see Magnolia Well, I started in Evansville, Indiana. I played with a dozen different little bands, like, like Tennessee Tomcats and the Knox County Knockabouts. And then I got with the Clayton McMitchin and the Georgia Wildcats. And then I went from there to the Drifting Pioneers, and we used to get about seven years. Back in the 1930s, the major source for aspiring musicians in order to make a living wasn't phonograph records, and it wasn't necessarily personal appearances, it was radio. And the one in Merle's most immediate area was WLW Cincinnati. And he was brought in to play on the Boone County Jamboree, which was the biggest country music program at that time in that particular area. There was a quartet that Merle and Grandpa were a part of the Delmore Brothers. They sold some records and uh, had a great following, you know, the Browns Ferry Four. Grandpa Jones and Merle were both from uh, rural areas in Kentucky, and they had a lot in common to start with. And, uh, and then they, uh, when he was in Cincinnati, they started hunting together, I mean, as well as singing together on the same shows and all. They would uh, uh, hunt a lot together. They'd feast together. They, they just... Uh, seemed to uh, enjoy each other's company all, all, all their lives. So long, farewell, goodbye. I'm leaving you, now don't you cry. But I'll be back here. So Merle Travis was a wonder. He, he could fix your watch. Goodbye. Forgot mine. <laughs> draw the neatest cartoons there ever was. Lo and behold, he drew one and sent it to Grandpa Jones of Joe and I going to California. <laughs> That's when we were hillbillies. I didn't know any better. I was okay with that. When we were all at WOW in Cincinnati, after the programs were over, they were so early, we didn't eat breakfast before before we went to the programs. We'd go out and eat breakfast, and um, Merle would sit, do caricatures of people around him, you know. And then to go from that to California, woo, you know, it's like, yeah, buddy. So 1944, Merle Travis arrives in Los Angeles. Merle was on the scene at the right time. And he was a man who could sing, he was a man who could write, he was a man who had a great presence in front of a uh, camera. You know, as, as the cliche goes, the camera did love Merle Travis. I think the people in the business out there, be it um, recording or television or movies, if they saw something they liked and wanted it, they would pursue it. That was the difference in California music at that time. You know, the look was quite a bit different. It was a little more flashier than what was happening here. The sound was a lot louder, had a little bit more of an edge to it. One thing that he had said to me when I was a child, you know, you should always be dressed like a performer because it's called show business and you need to show them something, not they can otherwise just stay home and listen to your recordings. He said, don't just look like somebody that just stepped up out of the audience and walked on the stage. Be dressed like a star. I don't think that Nashville was big enough to handle everything that he was about. I don't think that Chicago was big enough to handle everything he was about or any other stop along the way until he hit Hollywood. One of the things that uh, makes Merle a hit once he gets out there in the larger world is he brings that 
rural Kentucky simplicity and directness, but he has a kind of a savvy that goes with that. Nashville was still a, a great center for country music, but Los Angeles had so much more. It had the movie industry. Uh, in a few years, television would be coming along, and Merle was right in the middle of all of that. Back in 1940, if you read the trades, it became obvious that something new was on the horizon in terms of mass entertainment. Actually, a uh, jukebox with a screen. And the idea behind this experiment was that if people were willing to pay five cents to listen to their favorite band, their favorite performer on a recording in a, in a standard jukebox, they would be willing to spend twice that amount, a dime, to not only listen to the music, but to watch it as well. No Vacancy was the first release that Merle did for Capitol Records, and it was kind of indicative of the kind of song that he would write and perform later on. It was a serious subject taken whimsically. And my heart beats slower when I read on the door, no vacancy. One thing that Soundies were not was politically oriented. They, uh, they were very, very pro-war uh, effort, and there are many Soundies that support our effort in World War II. But beyond that, we don't see a lot of politics. And here comes Merle Travis singing about um, GIs who return after the war and they can't find a place to live. All along the line, it's the same old sign waiting for me. No vacancy, no vacancy. And my heart beats slower when I read on the door, no vacancy. This crossover between the gospel feeling and more traditional country western music is very, very special, very unique. It's something you don't see in a lot of soundies or a lot of uh, musical appearances on film during this period. Less taken and more given. If you want to clink your silver spurs up on the golden stair, that means you, sister. That means you, mister. That means me and everybody's got to share. You can't be the devil's rooter. Gotta be a square shooter. If you want to clink your silver spurs up on the golden stair. The church music was such a big component. Merle was no stranger to that by any means. Merle had, had grown up in and out of, of revival meetings or camp meetings as they were called in that time and in that area. With Merle, you have an example of someone who not only would have been exposed to gospel music, but was genuinely a fan of it, a promoter of it, a writer of it. He recognized the power of gospel music and early on he's one of the first artists who's intentionally combining black gospel songs with white gospel songs and performing both of them side by side on the radio and then on records. Right road, brother. You gotta make your sense get out. Get old Satan out of that saddle. If you want to clink your silver spurs up on the golden stair. That means you, sister. That means you, mister. That means me and everybody's got to share. You can't be the devil's rooter. Gotta be a square shooter. If you want to clink your silver spurs up on the golden stair. Well, I think one of the interesting things about silver spurs is indeed uh, this gospel underpinning it. It starts as a, a traditional country western song, but then later in the song they're all clapping and singing, give me that old time religion. So it's obvious that they'd worked this up prior to getting to the Soundy Studios because it's a very tightly arranged piece. It's clear from listening to Merle's stuff that he was listening to all kinds of music. And then he was spending countless hours sitting in trial and error just blending these different elements. Uh, it's just inspiring. I wish I could, you know, jump in a time machine and sit there and watch him do it in person. Yeah, I think one of the things about Merle, he's coming from rural Kentucky, but as soon as he steps into the big city, 
uh, he's already he becomes very aware quickly of the different styles of music, where the popular culture is. Uh, that songs like "Smoke, Smoke, Smoke That Cigarette." He's involved with some Western swing sounds. He's not just limited to what he heard there at home. Well, come along, boys, and listen to my tale. Gonna tell you about the troubles on the old season trail. Come and tie a yippee 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 yippee. Come and tie a yippee yippee. Well, I started up the trail October 23rd. Started up the trail with the two you heard. Come and tie a yippee yippee yippee. Come and tie a yippee yippee. Now, the band that uh, appears in Old Chisholm Trail, also uh, Silver Spurs, and two or three others, was a group that was billed as Merle Travis and his Bronco Busters. It included a woman named Betty DeVere, who he had uh, heard up in the Salinas area. She was playing with the Fiddlin' Linvilles, and he brought her down to Los Angeles specifically to appear in this series of films. These were really low budget productions. And um, they would want to get the group in quickly. Let's get the soundtrack done in three hours. We've got three hours. Anything over three hours is overtime. We want to eliminate that. What do you have worked on? It's cloudy in the west and it's looking like rain, and I left my slicker in the wagon again. See, Travis became this kind of a big country western star. In those days, there was western music and country music, and the country western is what Travis did. Did you ever hear the story about Catalog Joe? He was meaner than the meanest dog. And he wore the fanciest cowboy clothes you could order from the catalog. He lived out west in Kalamazoo and was riding on the draw. Sure was. He could drink a sarsaparilla the quickest you ever saw. So sing the song of the cowboy with the F-I-N-B-I-O. He's about to rule up Kalamazoo on Catalog Cowboy Joe. When you're in Muhlenberg County, I think uh, one of the reasons that everybody's excited about Merle is because he left town. He's the one guy who left town and took the culture with him. And everywhere he went, he knew how to work it. He knew how to work it on stage. He knew how to work it on film. He knew how to work it as a cartoonist, as a writer. And uh, he just kind of owned the moment. He had a great smile, a great manner. Now, some of those old things where he tells little stories and then starts playing the guitar. The, the black and white films that I've seen of him doing, they're almost like early music videos of just one song. Tornado, if ever you got him sore, did you hear about the rowley head down at the corner drugstore? Oh, sure, he told that soda boy, I think I'll blow my top. But I'll save you trouble if you sell me a double slug of soda pop. When MTV came around and everybody was talking about this new medium called videos, I remember thinking, well, the first award they should give out was to Merle Travis and those guys back then, because they did it a long time ago. <laughs> you just turned on the color button. Other than that, they're the same. I grew up in the 80s when MTV changed everything about how we engaged with music. There was no more ugly bands. <laughs> you had to look good on video by the time the 80s rolled around. And I thought for a long time that that was the beginning of the whole connection of visual and music. And then went back and realized, no, actually there's been versions of this poking their heads up and going down and influencing things for decades. I've been too long on the run Gonna have my plane Gonna have my fun Hear the cowboys sing When the roundup's done He was just so great with words and, and being able to, to express a picture and a thought at the same time. So I'm hitting the trail to the setting sun Texas home never more to roam Here I come It's not just about the visual. There's artists, there's celebrities or entertainers who were all about the suit. They were all about the costume and the hat and the horses and 
The music was almost kind of secondary. Some of them could sing pretty well. Uh, but with Merle, you also have this <laughs> just explosive musical style that nobody had ever heard before. The direction that swing music went, it's much easier to think about the fiddles and to think about the horns sometimes and, and the, the sort of the tempo and the, the rhythm section of a swing tune. But there was nothing that, that swung any more than Travis's guitar style. Merle was the product of a whole bunch of different kinds of influences. In addition to the Appalachian hard country sound, he listened to all kinds of music. He loved blues, he loved western swing, he loved honky-tonk, and all these kinds of music kind of percolated in his head and it would come out as Merle. Turn down my invitation. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'll be shouting hallelujah all the day. And we'll have a jubilee down in Memphis, Tennessee. And we'll shout hallelujah all the day. The thing that I found so in common with Merle when I kind of lifted the hood and looked up under, you know, his musical uh, deal was that, kind of like in Mississippi, everything has a touch of the blues to it. but. Towns Van Zant said it, you know, there's two kinds of music. There's the blues and then there's zippity doo -dah. So everything that is good usually has just a touch of the blues and Travis sure, sure had a touch of the blues. Merle had a uh a wealth of musical knowledge. And I think he cashed in on it when he performed. Wherever his feelings and his talent took him in the moment could, could be the blues, uh, could be gospel, could be pop, could be country. It was like a melting pot of, of all that he knew and felt and was capable of presenting in such a magnificent way. And you never know which way he'd go. Hallelujah, all the day, all the day. Cliffy Stone had asked him uh, to do an album of folk songs. And Merle said, well, Bradley Kincaid and Burl Ives have done every folk song that has ever been written. Uh, so what am I going to come up with that's new? And Cliffy said, well, write some folk songs then. Folk Songs of the Hills, which came out in 1946, was probably Merle Travis's most personal statement, and maybe his, his, what you would call his seminal album. It wasn't a hit, but this is where everything from Merle's upbringing came out for the first time. Can't you hear that shake roll? Can't you hear that shake roll? Over by number nine. Merle was, his, he was really, uh, really famous for his coal miner songs. Being a Kentucky Muhlenberg, right? Muhlenberg County, I believe. Nine pound hammer. <clears throat> That's a little too heavy for my size. You know, there's a song about a fella who complained about a nine pound hammer being too heavy for his size. Still, at the end of the song, why, he suggested that they make his tombstone out of number nine coal. <laughs> the lazy rascal. Here's a song about that fella, the nine pound hammer. This nine pound hammer, just a little too heavy for my size, for my size. Roll on, buddy, don't you roll so slow. How can I roll? When the wheels won't go Gonna climb that mountain Just to see my baby And I ain't coming back No, I ain't coming back So roll on, buddy Don't you roll so slow Merle shined the light back through his songs on these miners and stuff back home. The people looked at them different. They saw them just as hard-working people, not just a bunch of thugs or 
roughnecks and all, they're just people having a hard time making a living, working a dangerous job, and Merle shined the light back on it and showed they were real people. It's a long way to Harlan, it's a long way to Hazard, just to get a little brew, just to get a little brew. When I'm long gone, just make my tombstone out of number nine coal, old number nine coal. Roll on, buddy, don't you roll so slow. Tell me, how can I roll when the wheels won't go? So roll on, buddy, don't you roll so slow. How can I roll when the wheels won't go? His song, 16 Tons, is one of those things that you can go anywhere and say 16 tons, and then people will say, oh, okay, that's who Merle Travis is. And then, oh, do, 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 do. What a lick in the finger snaps. Some people say a man's made out of mud. Poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bone. A mind that's weak and a back that's strong, you old 16 tons. What do you get? You got all these stories, but from the horse's mouth, Travis told me, he says, the reason I made up 16 tons, he says, you can't do anything in that song. You can't get born one morning when the sun didn't shine. You can't walk down, get born, walk down, and load 16 tons of number nine coal. It's not going to happen. Well, if you see me coming, you better step aside. A lot of men didn't, and a lot of men died. Got one fist of iron, the other steel. My right one don't get you well. My left one will load 16 times. The reason I made that song up is that's something my mom used to always say. Oh, look at this bicycle in the catalog, you know? And she says, oh, we owe our soul to the company store now, honey. We just can't get that. With Travis, he said, I wrote that because if you say something people have never heard, they'll remember it. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go, cause I owe my soul. To the company store. Travis said, I wrote 16 tons because it sounded like a folk song. And he says, I never cared for it. Really, to be honest, till Tennessee Earning Ford sold 5 million copies, that's, he said, might have been the time it became my favorite folk song of all time. If you were around Merle and let him get to talking about coal mines, you couldn't help but want to hear what he said. You know what? A coal miner's job is one of the toughest there is. It's like an old fella told me one time, once a miner, always a miner. If you work in the mines, the coal set gets in your blood. That's according to me and according to this song. Dark as a Dungeon is a song that is as deep as any song in the American songbook. And the song itself is very cinematic. But it's born of experience, born of legend. Um, but it, it, is, it is worthy of its praise. Where it's dark as a dungeon and damp as the dew Where the danger is double and pleasures are few Where the rain never falls and the sun never shines It's dark as a dungeon way down in the mine the thing that I've learned to cherish the most is the, the verse that doesn't get, get used much, you know. Come all you fellers, so young and so fine, seek not your fortune in the dark dreary mine. It'll form as a habit and seep through your soul till the stream of your blood Runs as black as the coal 
Where it's dark as a dungeon And damp as a dew Where danger is double And pleasures are few Where the rain never falls The sun never shines It's dark as a dungeon Way down in the mine It's a many a man I have known in my day Who lived just to labor his whole life away Like a fiend with his dope and a drunkard his wine A man will have lust for the lure of the mines Where it's dark as a dungeon and damp as the dew Where the danger is double and pleasures are few Where the rain never falls and the sun never shines It's dark as a dungeon way down in the mine That verse we spoke about, I call it the unused verse Or the underused verse, I love it Oh, the midnight, the morning or the middle of day is the same to the miner who's digging away. The demons of death often come by surprise. One fall of the slate, then you're buried alive. It's dark as a dungeon. Down as the dew Where danger is double And pleasures are few Where the rain never falls The sun never shines It's dark as a dungeon Way down in the mine And I pray when I'm dead and the ages shall roll That my body would blacken And turn into coal Then I'll look from the door Of my heavenly home And pity the miner Who's a-digging my bones Where it's dark as a dungeon and down as the dew where dangers double and pleasures are few where the rain never falls the sun never shines it's dark as a dungeon way down in poignant a song that's ever been written, almost like a hymn is being sung, a folk ballad from another time is being sung, but the entire story of their, of their lives is wrapped up in, in the walls of that song. And whatever came upon Travis to write that song, you know, it was mighty good of him and the Lord to do that for us that day because it's a magical song. One of the things I loved when I was a kid is the fact that Travis was uh, singing to me. And my, my friends, it wasn't all just for adults. He'd have a song on there, like uh, he had this one muskrat talking about all these different animals, and then he'd have his guitar talk. Down in Kentucky, when I was a little fella, an old fella from Virginia come down to board at our house and work in the coal mines. He brought his guitar along to play at night after a hard day's work, and he sung a song about a muskrat and a rooster and a tomcat and a bunch of barnyard animals all combined, and he made his guitar talk. At least he told us kids he did. Here's the way the song went. Now, muskrat, muskrat, what makes your back so slick? 
Been a living in the water all of my life, and it's a wonder I ain't sick. I ain't sick. I ain't sick. Well, I never heard a guitar talk before, so this was very unique. Like, uh, uh, let's take the bluebird. You go, well, bluebird, bluebird, why do you fly so high? Uh, I've been eating these acorns all my life. It's a wonder I don't die. 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 Hear him say, I don't die. What makes your spurs so hard? Been scratching in the barn lot all of my life, and it's a wonder I ain't tired. I ain't tired. I ain't tired. Tomcat, Tomcat, what makes your tail so long? <laughs> I've been prowling around all these nights. It's a wonder it ain't gone. It ain't gone. It ain't gone. It ain't gone. See if you ever heard this. Yeah, six minutes. Merle would uh, would party a little bit, and a few times he got in trouble. So at one time he would had been partying, is <laughs> haul him off to the hoose cow. He says they could tell that I'd had a nip or two, and so they put me in this paddy wagon. Got in there, and there was an old black man that was sitting in the paddy wagon. He's saying, "said a said a woman ain't nothing but sweet temptation." Travis, oh, I, he said, "I've never lost for grabbing a great title." What you are to me is what you'll always be, it seems. Sweet temptation, you smile and pass me by, but you still occupy my dreams. Maybe I've got lots of hidden charm. You'd find if you just hold me in your arms, but you're just sweet temptation. A diamond in the rough You make it all too tough for me Sweet Temptation is just a wonderful piece. It's a charming, catchy tune, a real bouncy performance, and it doesn't, doesn't hurt that he's performing with June Hayden, who uh, he was either married to at the time or would be married to soon thereafter, and the interplay between the two really works in this particular film. Sweet Temptation is one of those songs that I think that has more to say about Merle's character and personality than he let on. Maybe I've got lots of hidden charm. And if you just hold me in your arms But you're just sweet temptation A diamond in the rough You make it awful tough for me One of my favorite of the uh, telescriptions is Too Much Sugar for a Dime. It's this interplay between uh, Merle and Judy Hayden that really, really works. She comes up uh, to him and, and basically says, you got another boast for me today? What's the big boast today? Have you bought the London Bridge? Oh, that little old thing. I just purchased Fort Knox. Now, if you'd like a new mink coat or something like wait that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's too much sugar for a dime. You're always handing me a line. That happens in the best convertible. Always brag about all you got, a swimming pool and a fancy This yacht, sort of loving but uh, contrary relationship between the two just works so well. Honey, I've done your dirt and chicken wiped your shoes on my silk shirt. That's too much sugar for a dime. It's really a wonderful combination of something that is very touching and moving, it shows the relationship between the two, and just some fine Western swing. I would come down off the shelf. I'm a Tex Ritter man myself. That's too much candy for the cost. I wouldn't say that. So do me a favor. What's that? Get lost. Well, I guess I'll give the devil his due. No, no, Trillo might refuse. That's it's too much sugar for a dime. Hey, this old dime ain't no good no way. Well, what's the matter with it? We've got a picture of Dave Barber on it. Well, turn it over. There's a picture of Peggy Lee on the other side. <laughs> That's too much sugar for a dime.
I'm sure that Merle Travis experienced uh, a hard life at one time or another, more than once. He wanted things that would make him calm down, and that just didn't happen for him. And I know one time he said to me, people say that I've got a drinking problem. He said, I don't have a drinking problem. I've got a powerful thirst. Anybody making great art probably is an outlaw. The term outlaw is mostly associated with uh, the quartet, Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson in the 1960s and 1970s. All that meant was that they were going against the grain, and the grain was Nashville. Well, that had been going on much, much earlier than that. It just wasn't called outlaw. And it's, it's interesting that the West is being used as the place where outlaw music went in the 1940s, because that's what was going on. You know, Ernest Tubb was an outlaw, and uh, Bob Wills was certainly an outlaw. They didn't copy each other. They had unique methods of playing music. Uh, nobody sounded like Merle Travis. Nobody sounded like Wills. Nobody sounded like Tubbs. Nobody sounded like Hank Williams. So they were all outlaws. There was no music more outlawish than Western Swing was. It challenged all of the conventions that country music was doing at the time. And Merle Travis fell into this. The term outlaw, what it means in country music is somebody that does his own thing. You know. Even as a family man, it was a performance. And so on one of my birthday parties in the home movies we have, it, he actually made up little cards. Well, he didn't make up cards. I think he painted it on the windows and said, you know, um, Merlene's birthday party and who, it, you know, directed by Merle Travis and all this stuff. And then he just took little shots like that. He also liked to be in the home movies, which wasn't often because he liked to run the camera. But um, he loved the outdoors. He loved to go fishing. They would take uh, fishing trips, and we've got great movies of him catching fish. And But even if you look at those, you'll see him kind of goof around on them. We were in the backyard in one of these films with, uh, he set up a whole, again, it was like a little story. And they set up a thing where he was golfing in the backyard. And I'm running around, and other kids are running around. And Cindy was only like, I don't even think she was a year old. And so he made this shot where it looks like he hits the golf ball, and then it pans over to Cindy, it's just a baby, and the ball bounces off her head. That was a ping pong ball, not a golf ball. But even in just the home movies, he was always staging something. So many uh, great artists pass on without the recognition due them. And luckily, Merle doesn't fall into that category. He was, um, he was honored any number of times during his career. And in some cases, we actually have audio or visual representations of what happened. Uh, Merle, Arthur, howdy. Aller, How are you? Fine. Uh, this is Merle Travis, ladies and gentlemen. Just here for this great uh, big day. How you feel, Merle? Well, I feel wonderful. It's good Making to be wife. back home. It's All right, Merle. Time. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard Gene Autry and Merle Travis here. And this is just the, before the start of, uh, of the ceremonies here at Ebenezer. In 1956, the people here erected a, a monument to Merle out near his home in Ebenezer, Kentucky, close to Beach Creek, between Drakesboro and Beach Creek at Ebenezer. And uh, probably the, one of the biggest crowds that was ever assembled in Western Kentucky was, was there that day, 1956. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, distinguished guests, I am very, very happy and was indeed honored to receive an invitation to attend this celebration here today in honor of my real good friend, Merle Travis. My parents never went to anything. All the time I was growing, you know, we never went to any music shows. We'd, we'd go, and my dad played fiddle, and we'd go to people's house and play. But my folks went from Nortonville, which is a further trip back then, it was, you know, 20 or 25 miles or something, over into Muhlenberg County for that day, and you know, probably 15,000 other people were here because Merle Travis, they were recognizing Merle Travis and showing appreciation to him. He meant that much to all the people in this area. When I used to live down here on the old Reed place, and used to walk up and down these roads barefooted going to the mailbox, I never thought that I'd get to come to Ebenezer under such an occasion as this and find out that I had so many friends. 
1965, I had a, an open road camper and a one ton dually truck. That's what we traveled in. I just put the band together and had a couple of hit records. And, and I was on one of these little windy roads back before the freeways and, and up in the Appalachians up there somewhere. And I was going around this hairpin curve, real slow in this camper, and people in the back trying to sleep. I was eating around this. And here come this other camper meeting me there, and it was Merle Travis in there, and we just locked arms out there and stopped right in the midst of that hairpin curve. And he said to me, he said, Merle said, you must be really doing good. He said, they're starting to introduce me as Merle Haggard. <laughs> he had one of those big um, console televisions and the whole top of it was cleared off, except for this Grammy, sitting right in the middle of it. It looked so tiny. So he walked out and he said, how are you? Gave me a hug and a kiss. And he said, there's my Grammy. And I walked over and I said, dad, it's great. And he says, you want to hold it? I said, I do want to hold it. And so he says, well, go ahead, pick it up. I said, really? He says, go ahead, pick it up. I picked it up and the plate promptly fell off. And he looked at it and I looked at it and he said, now that'll humble a man, won't it? <laughs> but the last time I saw him was at a stoplight on Gallatin Road and Due West in Nashville. He was in that canary yellow convertible with red interior with California plates that read 16 tons. And Dorothy was driving. He was in the passenger side. He had on a mint green nudie suit with deer on it, a red shirt and that bolo tie that he wore and aviator sunglasses. And I found out later he was on his way to tape Hee Haw. His top was down. And I pulled up next to him in my Jeep. I said, Trav, hello, Miss Hulk. I said, how you doing? And he pulled those glasses down and said, what do you think? And took off. And that's the last time I got to see him. You know, it's hard to talk about my dad without talking in his voice, how he used to talk. We were playing poker, and he's good. I had $10 left, and he beat me. I thought, he won't take my $10, but he took my $10. And so he put it up, <laughs> made a big ceremony out of folding it up. This is gonna be special for me someday. He's gonna be a big singing star and all that stuff. Like that. Travis, and he says, I'm gonna send you a piece of advice for $10. I said, yes, sir. He said. If you're going to be a country music singing star, you're going to go through a lot of ups and downs, heartaches. You're going to go down in the hole several times. He says, but for $10, I'm going to tell you how to get out of that hole. I said, tell me more. He says, when you come up out of that hole, he said, best thing for you to do, go buy you a Cadillac. And go, 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 go to nudies and get you a suit, rhinestones. Feel good about yourself. Find your guitar and put you some new strings on it and, 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 and learn a new song to sing that makes you feel good about yourself. When Dad died unexpectedly on October 20th, 1983, this is what he had in his pockets. His knife, looks like a part to a guitar, some flat picks and thumb picks, and that was it. His entire life, all he did was perform and play music. He had wives and he had kids, but that wasn't his uh, number one priority. His number one priority was performing and playing that guitar. You know, he just wanted to play that guitar and that's what he felt comfortable doing. His dad used to say to him, I know you write songs and make music, but how are you gonna earn a living? What do you do to make money? He just never felt worthy of what he had because he thought so much of his dad and his brothers. I think that was a lot of the insecurity too. My dad was so talented at so many things, but especially at playing guitar. And it came so naturally, and he did it from the very beginning when he was young, that he didn't think he was anything special. Uh, do you have any uh, favorite instrumentals, any particular song you like to play? No, not necessarily. I made a record of I'll See In My Dreams, I think it was fairly listenable. And I made an album called The Merle Travis Guitar that I was kind of proud of, outside of that by. I don't have anything to brag about. So when he got a lot of attention for it, and more and more and more as he got older and older and more famous and everything, he just didn't understand why. 
He would never accept credit for what everyone knew was his invention and his glory. He just was embarrassed by it. He was just so darn modest. I wonder if he really knew how good and how important he really was. His accomplishments were, were many, and uh, they were the things that I admired. I wanted to be a songwriter, and I wanted to play guitar, and I wanted to sing. And so his success was an example that I followed. Why do we even love music? Why do, why do notes kill us? Why does color, why does any of that matter? Why does beauty matter? I don't know, but it's gotta be true. And Merle Travis knew how to give that truth. We think about it every day and talk about something funny he said. You know, he was, he was funny to be around. You know, he had a lot of funny expressions. And we, we talk about him every day. Uh -huh. It's a part of our history, and I, I knew him, and I'm proud that I knew him. The stuff that we'll all take with us to our grave is being able to spend time with people that, that were so real and so deeply entrenched in the art that they provided with us, and I want to thank Merle Travis for that. Happiness is a friend who has usually been around, but heartbreak and sorrow are old acquaintances of mine. I've tasted success and I've gorged on failure. I've walked on red carpets and waded mud. Music, entertaining, songwriting, and show business in general has been my life. I've never worked another trade. I hope I never will.